The Cessna 172 Skyhawk is one of the most important light airplanes of all time. A staggering total of over 43,000 Cessna 172s of all models have been built, with the first one being introduced in 1956, and the type is still flying off the production line in 2009. The Skyhawk was a sales success from its very first year of production when over 1,400 were produced. Its rise to being king of the general aviation world really should come as no surprise. The Cessna 172 is a perfect mix of good performance and rugged durability, and it has proved itself to be one of the safest light aircraft ever built. The aircraft's reliability keeps ownership costs down, and its forgiving flight characteristics have made it a trusted training aircraft. There have been about 20 versions of the Skyhawk manufactured over the years, starting with a basic 172 that was available until 1960. Fast forward to 2009, and the engine power has increased to 180 horsepower, and the airplane features an increased cruise speed of 126 knots, along with over 50 years of other refinements to the overall comfort and dependability of the aircraft. Although many student pilots may actually do all of their initial training on the Cessna 172, more often than not, it is considered a step up from the Cessna 152. The Cessna 152 tends to fill this starter aircraft role better because it has lower operating and maintenance costs. After a student has built experience on the 152 and has perhaps soloed in this smaller airplane, it's not long before they move on to the larger Cessna 172. After committing to memory the important air speeds and limitations of the Skyhawk and having demonstrated to their instructor that they are ready for the faster speeds and performance, the student is usually ready to solo in the new type after just a few hours of familiarization. They're now able to enjoy all the benefits that the Skyhawk provides, such as a more spacious cockpit, more power, and higher cruising speeds. You are about to experience what it's like to fly the Cessna 172 Skyhawk as we undertake a training flight in the experienced and capable hands of Arna Krutoff. Arna is the President, CEO, and Chief Pilot of Florida Flight Training Center, operating out of beautiful Venice Municipal Airport in Florida. Arna's logbook includes everything from gliders in his early years to heavy multi-engine commercial jets, and his passion for aviation and flight training are obvious to all those that know him. In the training seat today is Saurabh Manga, a Florida Flight Training Center student with lofty goals of flying commercially in the near future. He has previously soloed in the single-engine Cessna 152 and is ready to move on to the challenges of a larger and higher performing aircraft. The aircraft for our training flight today is a Cessna Skyhawk 172R, carrying the registration of November 434 Echo Papa. The R model was the first 172 to have a factory-fitted fuel injection engine with other improvements including a maximum takeoff weight of 2,450 pounds, a new interior with soundproofing, and more comfortable adjustable front seats. This aircraft was built in 1998, just two years after production of the Skyhawk restarted. It is powered by a four-cylinder Lycoming engine providing a maximum cruise speed of 122 knots and a range of over 600 nautical miles. Venice Airport was built in the 1940s as a military training base during World War II and after the conflict became a civilian airfield. The airport boasts an ideal location right on the Gulf of Mexico and is bordered by a wildlife preserve, a golf course, and Florida's famous white sandy beaches. It is about 20 miles from Sarasota Airport to the north and 50 miles to Fort Myers Airport to the south. This offers student pilots local uncongested training airspace as well as controlled airspace just a short flight away to help develop radio communications and instrument approach skills. The airport has two 5,000-foot crossed runways offering four distinct approaches. They are runway 1331 and runway 422, each measuring 150 feet wide. 
There are over 230 aircraft based at the airport, and annual movements vary between 165,000 to 175,000 per year, which averages over 450 per day. Air Utopia welcomes you on board for a personal flight training experience to witness a student pilot's progress as he makes the move up to the higher performance Cessna 172 Skyhawk. Today we're going to fly an aircraft that is a little bit bigger. Uh, you will enjoy this airplane a lot better. Uh, it has more space, more room, it has a lot more power and it's going to feel more stable. And uh, it's going to also be a little bit awkward because your little friend, the Cessna 152, you got used to. And here is its bigger brother and there will be some familiarization issues. But no sweat, it will take less than an hour for you to become acquainted and used to the 172 and to transition into this airplane okay. to the point where you can fly it by yourself. That's how long it will take, just one hour. Uh, there's some differences with the aircraft. Uh, we now have a fuel selector with which you can choose both just like in the 152, but you can choose left tank or right tank for balancing purposes, okay? Because you have four seats, you could have some people all sitting on one side, there's more luggage room in the back, so you might want to use more fuel from one side instead of the other side, okay? So that's one, one difference. Uh, everything pretty much is still in the same position, we have a lot more radios. Uh, this airplane now has a audio panel where you need to know how to select the proper radio. It takes a little time to get used to. Uh, the other thing is uh, instead of turning all the radios on and off individually, we have a radio master switch. Okay, so in addition to the master switch, after the engine is running, we turn on a master switch. Okay, uh, it's a newer aircraft, uh, the seats are not 30 years old, uh, it has a uh, almost like a car type seat belt that will move as your body moves and especially the space will really, you will, you will appreciate, it's easier to turn around and look around, the windows are bigger, everything is bigger. Now the 180 horsepower are going to make the airplane fly sooner climb better, it will be more stable during taxi, you are ready for the next stop, you are ready to fly a bigger airplane. Alright, any All questions right. on what we're going to do in the 172? Are they, the maneuvers going to be the same? Uh, I would suggest that we do exactly what we have been doing in the Cessna 152, so we will do the normal takeoff climbing out uh, to 2,000, 2,500 feet, depending on the cloud layer. We are going to the practice area. And then once we get to the practice area, we will start with the slow flight or the minimum controllable airspeed. And out of the minimum controllable airspeed configuration, we will initiate the power off stall. You will fully recover, then we will do some more clearing turns and do some steep turns, both to the left side and the right side. And then after that, we will come back to the field. You will show me a proper entry into the downwind, proper uh, communication procedures, and a uh, short field landing. Okay. We've discussed and practiced the short field already. And then, um, taxi back to the, uh, to the school. Right. If everything goes uh, as planned and you are consistent uh, again, then um, sometime in the later on in the afternoon or perhaps tomorrow, I will get out of the airplane and you're going to fly this airplane by yourself. Beautiful. All right.
The flight school is about 22 miles south of Sarasota, Bradenton, between Sarasota and Fort Myers. So we have two airports right around us for good practices of control towers and approaches when we are doing our instrument flight. Looking over here on the shade of the colors, you have the return uh, intensity. You can see a few red spots over here, uh, which means that it's, it's really, really intense around this area. We definitely have thunderstorms, towering thunderstorms, maybe up to 40, 45,000 feet with heavy uh, icing and precipitation uh, and definitely a lot of turbulence. You can see uh, a cumulonimbus cloud going from probably about 3,000 to 45,000 in 45 minutes. The, the amount of damage that that can do to your airplane if you fly through that is unbelievable. The force of nature, the power of nature should not be messed around with to always check your weather even if it's a local flight. Today, how do you want to do it? Is it, is it booked? Uh, it is, mm, it's back until 5.30 so it's available for 5.30 I don't know if it's best. Municipal Airport. Automated weather observation. One, three, five, five, Zulu weather. Wind, one, two, zero, at three. Visibility, one, zero, clear, below, one, two, thousand. Temperature, three, two, Celsius. Dew point, two, seven. Altimeter, three, zero, one, five. Remarks. Density altitude, one, thousand, seven, hundred. Venice Municipal Airport is in a noise-sensitive community. Runway 22 is a noise abatement and calm wind runway. The traffic pattern for runway 13 is right hand. We have ignition that is off. Check. We have documents and POH. POH is here. We have our documents over here. We have the registration certificate and the airworthiness certificate over here. Control lock is removed. Control lock. Control lock removed. Check. Master switch comes on. Check. It flaps down. Approximately 12 gallons in each tank, left and right. Two on and check. Master switch goes off. Check. Cabin inspection is complete. Now let's go for the airframe inspection. Let's move outside. Okay, the airframe inspection starts with the empanage. Gust lock removed. Okay, very good. Let me take that from you. I'll put that in the cabin. Uh, tie down. Alright. The uh, control surface is checked. Ele elevator connections check. Static seems to be fine. Good. Free movement, no obstruction. Let's check the rudder. Check. Touch and bolts and wires seem to be in place. No loose connections. All right. Antenna seems to be good. That's very good. Then we go to the right wing over here. The condition of the flap. Flap track seems to be good and greased. Okay. The flap rails, you checked also. Yes, sir. Check. Then we move to the aileron. Check the aileron. The movement, no obstruction. Okay, and check the hinges from this side. Very good. Hinges seem good. Okay. Then we remove the wing tie down. Very good. And then we go to the main wheel. We'll check for proper inflation. Check. Looks good at 28 PSI. All right. Then we're going to the fuel drains. There is one, there is two, there is three, four, four and, five. and five. 
No sediments, no water in the first. Okay. Aim for the second jump. On the next. Looks good. Okay, very good. Now let me throw that back in the tank for you. All right. Should be a minimum of four quarts for local flight. About six. Okay, that's good. Okay, and then we check the propeller and the spinner. Seems good, no cracks or mixed or ticks. Okay, then move your head down and check the air intake. You can look at your exhaust at the same time and the nose wheel strut. Here, the tire, whole nose gear. Looks good, all lots of tools in place. All right. Then uh, we do the same thing on this wing with the fuel. We're going to take the uh, tie down off here. Very good. How does that fuel look? Looks good. Let me throw that uh, in the fuel tank. While well, you climb on the wing and check visually to make sure there's sufficient fuel in the fuel tank. Check, we have about 12. Then we'll check the Pito 2 here. Make sure there's no Check there's bugs, no bugs can build a nest in your pedo tube sometimes overnight. It looks like concrete and this little opening is blocked. But this one is uh, open and clean. Okay, no blockages. The stall warning horn. And remember we uh, suck on that. Can you get to it? Yeah, Let me do it. Let me do it. I can get to it. Stall warning horn works. Okay, fuel tank vent check. Fuel tank vent is right here. There you check. go. No obstructions. All right. And then we're going to the left wing trailing edge. The flap here, the tracks, and the connecting rod, rails we checked. And then we go to the aileron again. We check the hinges, the three hinges that connect the aileron. Check hinges good. Be careful with trip. sticking your fingers in there because if there's any kind of wind, that will take your finger off. Check. Okay, very good. Static looks good. And then the airframe inspection is complete. Check. You'll notice a lot of differences in the layout of the Cessna 172's cockpit depending from production year to the owner's preferences. The instrument on the dashboard here is the magnetic compass, which is a basic requirement for every airplane. It comes along with a compass deviation card. It basically shows the deviation of the compass because of the electrical instruments and the electromagnetic field around the airplane. There are two basic principles of operation of the instruments on this airplane. One of them being the pyrostatic instruments, which include the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the vertical speed indicator. The other being gyroscopic instruments, which include the attitude indicator, the turn and slip coordinator, and the heading indicator. In order for the gyroscopic instruments to work properly, the casing needs to be in a vacuum. For this, we have a vacuum pump, which gives sufficient amount of suction to keep these instruments working properly. The suction gauge tells us if we have enough suction required for the proper functioning of these instruments. Here we have a digital clock and we have the airspeed indicator, the attitude indicator, the altimeter, 
Here is the OBS or the Omni Bearing Selector we use for navigation so actually act as instrument and ILS approaches with this particular airplane. The four sets of gauges that we have here, the one on the top left being the fuel gauges for the left and the right tank. Here we have the EGT which is the exhaust gas flow indicator the exhaust gas temperature. is a gauge in Cessna 172 which shows the temperature of the exhaust gas from the engine. It helps us set our mixture better in flight when we're cruising. Every airplane has a reference point on its EGT where it will give the best efficiency. So when you're cruising usually about 3000 feet and you want to lean the mixture, you usually lean it to the reference point to get the best efficiency out of the engine. Here we have the oil pressure and temperature gauges. And here on the bottom right, we have the vacuum and the ammeter. This is the turn and slip coordinator and the inclinometer, the heading indicator, the vertical speed indicator or the VSI. We have our second OBS or Omni bearing selector, which only includes the localizer. Here we have the tachometer for the engine. You'll notice here that there is an instrument used for navigational purposes called the ADF or the Automatic Direction Finder. Behind the Tolio, we have the fuses. The switches that control the lights of the airplane are below the fuses. We also have something new in this airplane which is an avionics switch, which basically controls all the radios with just one button. It makes starting the airplane and turning it off much easier. Here we have the engine throttle. We have the mixture. The big wheel here controls the trim on the elevator. We have the radio selectors, radio 1 and 2. Here we have our GPS. We have our comms 1 and nav 1, that's communications 1 and navigation 1. We have our comms 2 and NAV2, that's communications to and navigation to. Here we have our transponder, which is also an altitude encoding or mode C transponder. And here we have an autopilot, which is being deferred. The plate here that you can see behind the controls are flap position indicator on the flap switches. Below the instrument panel, you have the rudder pedals, two for each pilot. At the top of the pedals, we have the brakes. The left actuating the left brake and the right actuating the right brake. You can press one brake at a time to activate differential brakes, which is usually used during turning, or if you want to slow down or get the airplane to a complete stop, push the pedals together. Uh, all right, the, uh, the parts are briefing. Uh, first of all, we're going to uh, taxi to runway 22, noise abatement runway, winds are calm. Uh, after takeoff, anything happens to this airplane seriously affecting safety of flight, we return to this field. Okay. The third thing we brief on is, of course, when everything goes as planned. And then we will climb to 2,500 feet, go to the practice area and proceed per my directions. Any no, questions on no that question departure no. briefing? The cabin doors are closed, closed on the top. right side, closed on the left side. Seat belts on on the right. Check. On on the left. The brakes are set. Check. Check. Okay. The fuel selectors are on both. both. Circuit Check. breakers are all in. Check. Then the beacon is on. Check. The avionics are off. Check. The mixture is idle. Check. Throttle open a quarter inch. Master Check. switch on. Check. Okay, now we're going to turn the ox fuel pump on. Check. Put the mixture rich. Move the throttle forward. And watch a rise on the fuel flow. Check. Okay, then bring the uh, throttle back and to a quarter open and the mixture to idle cut off and the ox fuel pump goes off. 
Check. Okay, the before starting engine checklist is complete. Check. We are now going to start the engine with the key. When the engine fires, the mixer goes where it's first. So your right hand is on the mixer. All right. And then you adjust the, uh, the power as necessary, Check. okay? All right. Clear prop. Clear prop. There is a difference between the Cessna 152 and the 172 when it comes to starting the engine. Instead of using a primer, we use something known as an auxiliary fuel pump that pushes fuel into the cylinders which helps ignition and combustion. The fuel pump is turned on and wait for about 3 seconds to see that the fuel flow needle actually shows an indication of a good amount of fuel flow into the engine. And after that, you turn it off. You make sure that your mixture is lean and you start the engine by turning the key into the ignition. When getting into the airplane, it's important to adjust the seat and make sure that you're seated so you have a good overview of everything around you and you can reach instruments as well as the rudder pedals. On a regular takeoff, we don't usually use flaps, so you'll see us putting our flaps up before we start taxi as it's a part of the after engine start checklist. After starting the engine, a normal procedure is something known as a radio check. We basically do that to make sure that the radios are working well and the clarity of the voice is good. We are listening to the weather and making sure that the winds are favorable for runway 22 which was discussed in the departure briefing. Another procedure followed in the after engine start checklist is brake check or the brake test. You let the airplane taxi a bit ahead and you put pressure on the brakes to make sure that the airplane stops. Every airplane has a set maximum takeoff weight which you are not allowed to exceed. You also have a maximum ramp weight which slightly exceeds the maximum takeoff weight because while taxiing you burn off fuel and while doing your engines run up you burn fuel. So the ramp weight might be slightly higher than your maximum takeoff weight. Number 44 Echo Papa as compared to other Cessna 172s has a higher rated engine at 180 brake horsepower as compared to normal 160 brake horsepower. So you don't really need a lot of power to taxi this particular airplane. Sometimes with a light load the airplane can start taxiing and moving at an idle RPM. Taxing any airplane using power is much better than using brakes. That's why it's a recommended procedure to slow down the airplane by reducing the power.
Before takeoff or departure, an uh, important procedure to be followed is the before takeoff checklist, which includes the engine drawn up instrument check and control check. During the engine run-up, you check the engine's magnetos and you check the other indications on the different gauges, including the oil pressure and temperature gauges. It starts by taking the engine to 1800 RPM, checking the left and right magnetos respectively. There shouldn't be a drop of more than 125 RPM for each engine, and definitely not more than a difference of about 50 to 70 RPM between each indication. I'm looking at the tag to see those readings. I find the engine running a bit rough because of uh, carbon buildup on the spark plugs. So Arna shows me how to clean the engine. It involves him adding power and slowly leaning the mixture until he gets maximum engine output. After running the engine on uh, this high setting for a minute, we slow down again to check the magnetos and to see if the engine is running good or not. I find it running up to standards, so we slow down and continue on with our check. It includes doing the instrument check, making sure that all the instruments are working fine, as well as the control check, which includes checking the three main control surfaces, the ailerons, the elevators, and the rudder pedals. I'm making sure that there's no obstructions and the controls are moving smoothly. I'm setting the heading indicator according to the reading on the compass, which is standard procedure. I'm also setting the attitude indicator so the little airplane is referenced well to the horizon. When it's being an uncontrolled field, it's a good idea to run a good practice to look for traffic every time you're taxing or ready for takeoff. You see me looking on the left for traffic since we're taking off from runway 22. Once I'm on the center line and ready for takeoff, I slowly start adding power and you see me holding the throttle in place because I don't want the throttle to come out because of the vibrations the airplane goes through on the rough runway. The 172 overall having a much higher and much more powerful rate of engine as compared to the 152 makes it much easier to climb generally, even if it's a really, really hot day. Recommended climb speed on the Cessna 172 is 79 knots, which is also the best rate of climb speed. On a hot day like today, you'll still see us climbing at about 500 to 600 feet per minute, which for this airplane is remarkably good. Since I'm doing the flying and carrying out the checklist, you'll see Arna looking outside and keeping a good eye for traffic. 
Venice being an uncontrolled airfield, it's a good practice and generally for safety purposes to keep your eyes outside the airplane as well. about 700 feet and then exited the pattern at 45 degrees. Venice has some of the most beautiful beaches as you can see. It's a perfect training environment as well as a perfect environment for enjoying yourself while you're not flying. Since we are flying today by VFR or by visual flight rules, we had to keep certain distances from the clouds. That's why you'll notice us looking to figure out the tops and the bases of the clouds to find a good altitude to practice our maneuvers in. Since Venice is a noise sensitive community, runway 22 has noise abatement procedures, which mostly apply to jet airplanes, so there's no real restriction for smaller aircraft. Runway 22 is also the runway which is recommended for use when the wind is calm. The clouds you see are about 500 feet above us, which is well above the cloud clearance minimums required for this airspace. Looking at the instruments, you can see that we are right now at about 85 knots at 2,980 feet on a heading of 080, climbing at about 500 feet per minute.
I've just leveled off at about 3,500 feet and I adjusted the attitude indicator again for cruise flight. Recommended cruise setting for this airplane is about 2200 RPM at about 100 to 110 knots. I'm performing a maneuver called slow flight or minimum controllable airspeed which includes me slowing down the airplane to just above stall speed in a landing configuration. I slow down the airplane to about 1800 RPM and as the airplane slows down I add a notch of flaps. The first 10 degrees of flaps can be put down anywhere from 110 knots or below. On the airspeed indicator you can see the white arc which is the safe range for putting the flaps down 20 and 30 degrees. I keep lowering my flaps until my airspeed comes down to the slowest controllable speed of this airplane. I start pitching up to maintain altitude and to compensate for the drag I'm gonna start adding power. Since we are at a low airspeed, a high pitch and a high power setting, the left turning tendencies are at maximum play here. That's why I'm going to be using a lot of right rudder to compensate. airspeed is the airspeed at which I still have the use of my flight control. The reason why I'm doing such a slow turn or a shallow turn is because as you bank the airplane the stall speed increases. I'm very close to the stall speed right now, so I don't want to bank too much. I'm maintaining 15 knots in this maneuver, which is close to stall speed, so it is actually the minimum controllable airspeed. I'm going to be performing a power off stall now. I start by getting the airplane into a descent mode or an approach mode. That's approximately 500 feet per minute descent on the BSI. Why we practice stalls in flight training particularly is so that the student understands what a stall is, why it's bad, and more than anything else, if he ever gets into a situation where the airplane begins to stall, he can recover from it. I keep descending until I reach approach speed and at approach speed I start putting back pressure on the elevators which makes my pitch go up. I hold the pitch until the airplane stalls. At the first indication of a stall I put my nose down and add power which is the recovery technique including putting the first notch of flaps up. I keep maintaining altitude to wait for my airspeed to increase so I can continue putting the flaps up and recover completely from this maneuver. I have now successfully recovered from the maneuver and I'm level at 3000 feet, approximately 100 knots. I'm not going to be demonstrating steep turns, for which I got to make sure that I'm well clear of traffic or I've cleared the area. It's a part of my pre-maneuvering checklist. I 
I first start the steep turn to the left by turning the airplane 45 degrees. I'm looking outside for visual references as well as traffic. I started my steep turn heading due east. I'm going to start my rollout about 20 degrees before my entry heading. As soon as I roll out on my entry heading, it's time for me to start one to the right. I do the same procedure by turning 45 degrees to the right. I'm looking outside for traffic and visual references. I maintain the same altitude by making adjustments to my pitch. At such a steep bank, I do lose some vertical lift, so I add about 100 RPM. I start my rollout at about 20 degrees before my entry heading. Keeping the airplane coordinated during turns and levels flight is really important. The ball or the inclinometer on the turn and slip coordinator tells you how much rudder is to be put in. As you see here, the ball is in the center, which means that I am in a coordinated turn to the left. Performing the maneuvers, we've turned back to Venice, and as you can see, we've started descent out of 3,000 feet. We're right now at about 2,400 feet, continuing our descent down into Venice. The red knob that you see is the mixture control. It controls the amount of fuel. From the ground up to about 3,000 feet, the mixture is full rich. But as you start going above 3,000, the air starts getting thinner or less dense. You start leaning the mixture slowly depending on the engine's tachometer. You don't want to over lean the mixture because it can cause the engine to overheat and can also cause the engine to quit. So it's really important to be confident about the way you lean the mixture of the airplane.
This antenna here is for the ELG or the emergency locator transmitter. The ELT activates when there's a traumatic force to the airplane. It sends out a signal on 121.5, which basically allows emergency services to track the position of the airplane down. The antennas on the tail here are for the VOR receivers for navigation purposes. Venice being an uncontrolled airport, it's important to make radio calls of your position and intentions. It lets other pilots in the area and the traffic pattern know what you're about to do so they can look out for you. There's been a significant buildup of clouds since this time we departed Venice. We're choosing an altitude depending on the clouds which would be perfect for approach into Venice. For safety purposes, the use of checklist is highly recommended. We're performing the approach and descent checklist right now. A part of the descent and approach checklist is checking the weather again. That's why I'm going to tune into the AWOS frequency to listen to the weather. Runway traffic patterns are usually left turns unless otherwise mentioned. Here at Venice, we have runway 13, which is the only traffic pattern which turns to the right. If you choose to land on a runway whose traffic pattern is on the other side of the airport, the recommended entry procedure into the traffic pattern for that runway is to overfly the field at 1,500 feet, go outbound for about 2 minutes, and then turn in and join the downwind for the runway at a 45 degree angle.
after I'm done flying for about two minutes, I'm gonna start a descent and do a teardrop entry into the downwind. I'm gonna start turning right and descending to a thousand feet to be lined up to enter the left downwind for runway 22 at a 45 degree angle. Since the Cessna 172 LEC 152 is a high mirror plane, visibility is restricted because of the wings. Therefore, you'll see me always lifting my wing first to look for traffic and then making my turn in the same direction. I've descended down to a thousand feet at approach speed of about 95 knots and I've now completed the teardrop entry. I'm flying straight towards the left downwind for runway 2 to about a 45 degree angle and I'm going to wait to intercept so I can turn midfield downwind. I finished my turn and I'm established midfield downward for runway 22. As I come up a beam the numbers, I'm going to slowly pull back on the throttle and begin my descent down into runway 22. Since I'm well within the flap extension speed for the first notch of flaps, which is flaps 10, I put my flaps down. Once I'm at a 45 degree angle to the runway, I turn left base and continue on approaching runway 22. I continue slowing down so I can descend and put more flaps down. Radio calls at this part of the flight, especially for traffic which is on the ground, is important. Any traffic on the ground which is getting ready for should know of my arrival. I'm right now at about 80 knots, as you can see on the airspeed indicator, coming to slow down. I've now turned final and I'm aiming to line up with the center line of the runway. I have now put my last notch of flaps down to be in a good landing configuration. I'm going to target my approach speed of about 60 knots for this airplane. It's slightly faster than the Cessna 152 because it's heavier. At slower speeds as I'm coming into approach, I'm going to use my power to maintain altitude and my pitch to maintain airspeed. The exact opposite is used in cruise flight where I use pitch for altitude and power for airspeed. As I come above the runway, I pull my throttle back all the way to idle and I glide in for landing. So 
since we were doing a touch and go for this landing, the moment I touched down, I put the flaps up. I immediately add power and continue speeding up until the airplane is ready to take off again. After departure, you always fly the runway heading. That's why I'm making control inputs so that I can stay on the same heading. Probably one of the best singing engine airplanes I've flown. Stable is just an understatement. That airplane just loves to fly. It has its own personality. It does exactly what you tell it to do. The moment you add power, she's climbing. The moment you reduce power, she starts her descent. The good part about going from a Cessna 152 to a Cessna 172 is more space in the airplane. Having two more seats at the back changes a lot because you have more ventilation. Not to mention the brand new panel and the amazing sets of instruments and the new radios and bigger seats that of course add to your comfort level which add to the pleasure and the experience of the flight overall, especially when you're doing long flights. I'm now on the left downward for runway 22 at approximately a thousand feet. I'm cruising at 95 knots, which is perfect for this airplane in traffic patterns. I've slowed down and begun my descent, and as I'm well within the flap extension speed, I put my first notch of flaps down. about 550 feet on base for runway 22. I'm coming in at about 60 knots. On this landing, I'm demonstrating a short free landing. As I pass over the obstacle, I pull my power to idle and glide down to runway. I want to try and get the maximum distance out of my runway, so I want to land as soon as I can. I do that by putting my flaps up the moment I touch down. This transfers the weight of the airplane directly onto my wheels and kills the lift. and I've cleared off the runway. I make a radio call saying that I'm clear of all runways in Venice. Okay, after landing checklist.
after clearing off the runway, I do what is known as the after landing checklist. It involves me putting the transponder on standby, putting my landing light off, and putting the flaps up. Once we have completed the checklist and we have announced that we are clear of the runway to Venice, we can continue taxiing on to park our airplane. Some of the things that you want to look out while you're choosing a flight school, you want to make sure that you know the instructor to student ratio. When an instructor has a few students, he is able to give you more personalized attention. Things like financials are, of course, always there. Having contractual training probably helps you out because it gives you an idea of how much you will actually end up spending for your training, depending on the course that you've chosen. While you're looking for a flight school and once you see their prices, one thing for you to remember is that it's not always about the money, but it's about the quality of training that you get. You should actually consider spending more if you know that the quality of training that you're getting is much better. So it's more important to look for quality more than the price of the school. The procedure for shutting down the engine it includes making sure that the avionics are put off first so that you don't damage the radios and then you pull the mixture out and you put the magnetos off. Check. Magnetos. Off. Check. Navigation lights. Off. Instrument lights. Off. Uh, tie down lines for change, control locks. Uh, mixture, right. Outside, Master those are outside uh, items. Block checklist complete. Here's your checklist. Good flight. Thank you, sir. Very little to debrief uh, here. Um, perhaps uh, you know on the on the steep turn, uh, the the roll out, the second steep turn, the yeah, rollout was few degrees five later. degrees late. But yes. you know th those are uh, small details. Um, and then again, you know if 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 anything you do in the air, uh, always brief on what you're going to do. All right. Especially if it's non-standard. All right. Sure. Okay. And if you do a certain maneuver like a short field landing um, and you want to use an obstacle, make sure Call it's clear all right. that that's what we're doing. Okay, uh, that's all really. The rest of the flight was really nice. Thank you. I told you. Okay, uh, so, and this will only get more fun as we move into bigger aircraft. You will feel king the day that we come back from flying the Seneca, but that is still going to be a very small airplane to what you're going to fly in the, in the near future after that. Okay. Uh, you saw that all the things we discussed and did in the Cessna 152 up to standards made the transition very easy into this aircraft. Uh, you noticed that within an hour you were co totally comfortable flying this airplane. Absolutely. Okay? This is why it's so important that we do everything right the first time. In the teaching world we call it the law of primacy. You are starting to realize how important th these fundamentals were that I forced into your system. Absolutely. Okay? So the transition went relatively easy. 
you will see that the next time when we go into a bigger airplane, more complex airplane, the transition will be still easy. Do you have any questions on the debriefing? No. Okay. Uh, I really don't have a lot uh, to critique on. Uh, the flight was really good, so uh, let's keep going. Hello, my name is uh, Arne Krutov. I'm the owner of the Florida Flight Training Center. Uh, the Florida Flight Training Center is in Venice, Florida, and I started this flight school in 1992. I flew everything from little Cessnas to King Airs and DC-8s around the world. Today, uh, I have uh, almost 12,000 hours of flight time. A lot of times, people ask me what it takes to become a pilot. I would recommend go to the nearest flight school and find out. Most flight schools around the country, around the world, have competent people that can talk to you and tell you about all the advantages that aviation brings. So go out to the nearest flight school and find out for yourself. Once you think you have chosen that you want to become a pilot, um, let's first uh, think about where we should go, which country, uh, which area to pick a flight school. I think the most important thing is to look at the uh, quality of the flight training at that school itself. Secondarily, I think the infrastructure is very important and the availability of the material and the quality of the teaching itself. If your choice is to become an airline pilot, it is important to find a school that maintains airline standards. Big mistake that people make uh, once they start looking for a flight school is they choose the cheapest flight school or the school that offers cheap flight training. The problem with this is that flight training is not cheap. The Afgas or the fuel that we use for our aircraft and the whole support and infrastructure in and around the school, these are expensive things. To maintain quality, to maintain high standards, this costs a certain amount. People in this industry that are trying to bring in students to their flight school by offering not realistic prices for their aircraft and training are not the schools I would recommend. To put this a little bit more in perspective, uh, let's assume you have the choice between two schools and the school you like better cost, has a training cost that is $10,000 higher than the other school that you don't like so much. $10,000 is two weeks or three weeks salary by the time you become a captain and can quickly be earned back once we are professionals. A school with poor airplanes that have poor maintenance, bad teachers or a poor infrastructure perhaps has bad meteorological conditions for a big portion of the year will cost in time so much more than these ten thousand dollars that the choice should be to go for the school that is maybe a little bit more expensive but will make you smile and happy every day you come to flight school and will actually give you a good chance to go into this industry be able to earn your salary without too many frustrations the typical course here at the school would be somewhere between six and eight months. This will take you from the private through the instrument through the commercial level. Of course, one would have to do other things after that to be able to get a first job with an airline. But typically after a year and a half, perhaps with a flight instructor rating teaching for some four or five hours a day, uh, this person would become eligible and we be, would have a potential chance to get hired by a commuter or a major airline. Which means within a year and a half, this person could start earning money, executing the profession, the job that they dreamt of when they were younger. Uh, another piece of advice, 
to all of you out there. Uh, if your choice or your dream is to become an airline pilot, don't let the economy or the market discourage you from going to flight school. The typical aviation cycle is six to seven years where lots and lots of pilots are needed and then less pilots are needed. But the population is growing rapidly. Aviation is still the most popular and becoming more and more popular way to travel. Therefore, pilots will be needed and pilot shortages will become an acute problem again in the near future. If you're thinking about learning how to fly in the United States, these are some of the beautiful things in this country. We have an incredible infrastructure. Every town, every village in this country has its own runways, its own airports, where we can fly and airports that we can use daytime and nighttime. These airports at nighttime have lights that we can activate while being in the air without paying anything extra. Landings, we can make as many as we like, as many as we think are necessary to become good pilots at no additional cost. In the United States, we don't pay for the service of airways, the use of airways. In the United States, we don't pay additional money for practicing an instrument landing procedure. This is the only country where services are for the pilots and the whole system is designed and developed to support pilots. This is beautiful, this is unique. Add to that the beautiful country itself with its beautiful weather in most of the country and I think America is an excellent choice to learn how to fly. As a recommendation to the parents of all those youngsters out there that are dreaming about becoming a pilot, that maybe are afraid to talk to you and tell you that they want to become a pilot. Please don't discourage them. Please allow them to go to the nearest flight school, to the nearest airport, and let them try to fly an airplane. And if this puts a great smile on their face, and if you see that there is this dream, find out the possibilities and what it will take so your son, your daughter, can become a pilot. Um, often I get young people contact me who wear glasses, who are maybe overweight, short, uh, tall, or maybe feel that they are not uh, made for this profession. Uh, what we need to remember is, in aviation and in the pilot world, we look for stable, reliable and loyal people who don't make mistakes once they're sitting in the cockpit of an aircraft but for this you don't need to be a superman so every average person coming out of school has a fair chance to fulfill this dream